All right, guys. Hey, welcome to Reels and Heels as we're yelling at the dog here to be quiet. <laughs> Very glad that I had a few seconds for that. To <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have two really awesome guests uh, from the film industry. We have what you would call behind the camera, who does a lot of audio commentaries, uh, special features for Blu-rays and DVDs. And then we have somebody from in front of the camera um, who's done a lot of uh, stunt performing uh, and uh, creature acting all the way from New Zealand. Uh, Shane, and I'm going to mess up your, your last name. I know I am. <laughs> oh, man, don't, don't worry about it. I mess it up all the time. But, <laughs> it's, but, uh, but give it a go. It's is it uh Rangu? Ran Rangi? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You you did butcher it. <laughs> oh my no, God. it's um it's it's well pronounced properly, it's Rangi, Rangi. but you can say Rangi or Rangi. Rangi. Yeah, I butchered it. I'm not good with yeah. names. But that, then, that, that wasn't bad. That that wasn't a bad attempt because because when you said um like, like, apparently in Tibetan, if you say it in Tibetan, because it's spelt the same way, but they call it, um, but but they say, yeah, uh, rang, rangi is, um, it, it, it means, it means naughty. Mm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And then, uh, from Michigan, we have Michael Fle Felsher. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you got yeah. his name wrong, too. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey my, Michael understands, though, because he was calling uh what was it zach hatfield hartfield yeah the other night on the auction i kept calling him uh zach hatfield zach hartfield or whatever i kept getting that script so now and with the last thing like Felcher, you, well the last thing like Felcher, you can imagine the mispronunciations i've gotten over the years so uh i've gotten fletcher flesher fulcher uh felcher which is not good uh, and then there's just a whole bunch of other ones. So it, you you did fine. It's not. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I do have to promise. Hey, I'm no stranger to it either. So I try really hard not to mess people's names up. Well, hey, people like. Your, it has your, five letters in it. How do you screw it up? I mean, it, your, I mean, your first name is Nicole. And people think you're oh, yeah. Michelle all the time. So. Well, that's just because they're stupid. <laughs> oh, how but, does that happen? I, I don't know. But it's it, my last name's Jobin. And it's spelled just like. It's spelled like Robin, which I understand why they say Jobin. I get it. Because mm -hmm. it looks like Robin. Sure, Fine. Right. And they add a million other letters to it. <laughs> Jilbin. What? what? Stop. Or jo Jobin. 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 Yeah. <laughs> it's French. I'm sorry. Yeah. So for our viewers out there, we've uh, been running a contest for the 80s uh, yeah. documentary, the four-hour documentary, In Search of Darkness. The four-hour documentary. Yeah. Uh, everything from 1980 to 1989 was pretty much covered in that documentary. Uh, and yeah. so now we're going to pick our winner. I can't reach it. <laughs> <laughs> You gonna butcher that one too? Edward Charles Haas. 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 Yeah. Haas. I got that right. So Yay! Edward, we'll be reaching out to you with that digital copy. Oh, he decided to lay down. Yeah, he decided to lay down. So we'll start uh, with you, Michael, and then we'll kind of bounce off of uh, you and uh, Shane there. So, where did uh, everything for movies start for you? Oh. Uh, I think the first, I mean, I, you know, I was a movie kid growing up, but I think the first time I ever saw a movie, I know the first time I ever saw a movie where it became more than just something to do on a weekend, uh, was Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981. Uh, I remember seeing that movie and then started paying attention to like, okay, what's the cinematographer do? What, what's, who's that? And what's, cause I was just fascinated by the craft of that movie and it was only eight years old. So it wasn't like I was putting these thoughts together in my head with any kind of complexity, you know, I'm eight years old and going, who's that guy? And what's that guy do? And so then it, it just developed. And then I discovered horror through Creep Show, and then later Dawn of the Dead. And then that just exploded everything. George Romero was sort of my first filmmaker whom I em wanted to emulate in some way and make films like that guy. And uh, it just kind of snowballed from there all through high school. That was my obsession. I made short films and 
I spent most of my 20s kind of in and out of a bunch of Joe jobs and then eventually wound up at Anchor Bay Entertainment right around the beginning of the 2000s. And then I went out on my own and after that. And so that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. This year will be 15 years since I started doing uh, Red Shirt Pictures. Nice. Um, so what was the, the first project that you... Um, got yourself involved in uh whether it be a like a bit part acting or editing producing directing um well the first thing i ever did was an interview with uh, actress linnea quigley for a night of the demons dvd release that anchor bay did and i did it on spec on my own just to show them that i could do this because what i did at anchor bay wasn't really the the video stuff because they already had qualified teams doing all that but i really wanted to break into it so she happened to be at a convention near where I live in Michigan, and I went down there and talked to her about it. She agreed to do it. A couple of good friends, Mike, uh, and, uh, Mike Watt and uh, Amy Lynn Best, helped me film it. And then I edited it all together on my own and brought it to Anchor Bay's attention and said, here, we, I can do this. They used it on the disc, but they still said, they was like, well, we don't really have room for you to do this. We've got people to do it. So like, I understood that. And then uh, I went out on my own about a year later, and the first project I ever did was a documentary called After Effects Make Memories of Pittsburgh Filmmaking, which covered what it was like to make independent films in Pittsburgh when George Romero was there making it. And it centered around a, a kind of a lost film called Effects that uh, Dusty Nelson, Pat Buba, and John Harrison did together that hadn't gotten distribution yet. And so I helped them find a distribution deal, and I did this documentary, and that kind of led to one thing, which led to another, and so on and so forth. That's really cool. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, still to this day, that city, like George Romero, is like a, a king in that city. Like he's finally getting the recognition that he's deserved. Uh, uh, sadly, a lot of it's happened in the past couple of years after he passed away. But there's like a bust of him now in the Monroeville Mall where they filmed Dawn of the Dead and. He's, uh, he's very well, I think people are finally coming to terms with the fact that this guy who quote unquote just did a bunch of zombie movies was actually one of the most important independent filmmakers of all time and really brought filmmaking to another level in Pittsburgh when there was really no one else doing that. And uh, he, was a, he was a really great guy, a, a good friend and someone I got to collaborate with many, many times over the years. And I, I still, it's still hard for me to believe that he's gone. Yeah, um, I remember waking up that day and, and hearing the news. It was just, you know, uh, it it really did touch me. It was like we lost him and we lost Craven. And I was like, yeah, we've that... lost a lot of the people that were making movies while I was growing up. The, the genre guys who were out there really doing it every year, making movies. Toby Hooper's gone. Larry Cohen's gone. George is gone. Wes is gone. Uh, you know, we've lost a lot of really great, you know, Stuart Gordon just left. You know, it's just like, so I'm just not, I, this doesn't compute to me. It's like, no, 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 no. These guys are not allowed to go anywhere. What the hell is this shit? And it's, it's been kind of difficult the last, especially the last five years or so. It just seems like one right after the other. And it's, it's really upsetting. Yeah. I mean, we, we felt, we felt that bad uh, also when Stan Lee passed away because we're a huge comic book fans. Oh, fan. sure. Yeah. Well, Stan had a huge legacy, you know, in the comic world and then. So he, but he'd been around for, I mean, God, he was what, 92 or something when he passed away, something like that. I mean, that, not that or some, maybe even old, I don't even know, but he was, uh, he had a good long, we should all live so long, you know. True. We're all the age, though, that it becomes very evident that the generations before us are reaching their end. And that's, I think, the hardest part because we look back on our lives and we say just how important it was and how much all this stuff that we'd gone through molded us. And I think we mourn the people that pass because they were part of that. Yeah. It's difficult because you just, again, it's like, but these guys, I, I never, but they, I thought they'd be still making movies. Why, what's going on here? How can this, the, the passage of time sucks. I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. And if I could stop it, I would, but unfortunately I don't have that power. So. Yeah. And uh, you know, that, kind of segues into our next thing here. And this is why I, and you feel that it's important for what you do for movies, you know, preserving, making documentaries and behind the scenes to show the work of these these great individuals. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to document 
what it went into to make these creative endeavors. You know, I mean, even if the films themselves didn't turn out the way maybe they wanted to, a lot of hopes and dreams went into these things. I mean, I, I admire anyone who gets a movie made because it's a Herculean effort, if, whether it's an independent film or a big studio project, uh, to have an idea and see it all the way through the end with all the obstacles and all the roadblocks that come up. Uh, even something like, I always bring this one up, uh, I did a couple special features early, early on for a movie called Nail Gun Massacre. Now, Nail Gun Massacre is exactly the movie that you think it's going to be. It's, it's a movie about a guy who goes around killing people with a nail gun. Now, you might think, oh, that's, God, give me a break. But the guy who did it literally just had an idea, saw it through to the end, persevered, and got a movie made and distributed. And that's to be applauded and to be celebrated. And he was well aware of the fact of what movie he made. He wasn't under the impression that he made Citizen Kane. He knew what he was making. And yet at the same time, I mean, so many people have ideas and try to do things and they never get anywhere with it. They don't even try. And so it's important to, to celebrate these people and, and really and, and document what they went through in their lives at the time that led them to make these movies and also the techniques they used. Because most of the movies I deal with deal with pre-CGI technology when there was stop motion and animatronics and latex and makeup effects and all sorts of techniques that I wouldn't say are getting lost necessarily, but are certainly being overwhelmed by the ease of uh, being able to do something on your computer, which is both good and bad. So it's, it's great to be able to really, that's why makeup effects guys are often the people I enjoy working with the most because they're really happy that they get to share well, here's how we did this. Here's how we managed to do this effect during a time where we couldn't do it on an iMac or get a couple of guys on post to do it. And it's important to document these techniques because they're all building blocks. They're all steps in, a, in an endless staircase of, you know, the progress of time and creativity. It's really important to document that stuff uh, on the small level and on the big level, you know. Yeah. Hey, Shane, you want to go ahead and uh, jump in on that uh, since he did, you know, talk about makeup yeah, effect. Well, well yeah, I, I actually want to go to, to, to go back a bit um, as well. It, it's, it's like um, because you know I've I've also done um, I, I I literally went through that process of, of, of doing a short film and from mm -hmm. from basically from script all the way through and filming it all. Um, and, and and Michael's right, it is such a huge process. But mm -hmm. but you've also what I want to come back to is is that um, you know people that have these ideas and people that go through with them. You know, Nail Gun Massacre, uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I haven't seen it. But but one I did see that I, I sat down and watched and I was just like, how did this guy actually pitch it and how did it get made was Human Centipede. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. But, 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 but when those people have that vision and that passion and they go through and they make it and they actually get it out there, that's where movies become cult followings, you know, yeah. because big studios don't pick them up. But there's no. always there's always an audience out there. It's like music, and that you know it may not be a, it, it may not be what the what the studio sees as commercial, but there's always an audience out there, you know. Yeah. Um, and 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 you're right with the behind the scenes stuff with the makeup and and stuff like that because um, you know the the basically all people ever see is the final product. And, right. and and they don't see what what goes in there. But I think the good thing about um, about doing that is um, and and I I actually prefer seeing the behind the scenes after I've watched the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. Because otherwise, what tends to happen is that it ruins the magic that you're yeah. about to watch. Um, but it 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 is a, it is amazing. Me myself, um, I you know I I'm sort of like a uh, prosthetic specialist. I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in prosthetics, um, and it's 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 one of those things. It's it's not everyone's cup of tea, you know. Um, it's 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 funny. Like I, the reason how I got into creature performance and excelled in creature performance, and I, I, I didn't really realize it, is because of my acting background. Mm -hmm. um, I'd I'd literally approach a character, and there's no better way. To get into character than sitting in front in the makeup chair, sitting in front of the mirror, getting the makeup put on because oh, you yeah. can, you, you know, because you're, you're, you're being created in front of you. So visually, you get to see every piece of how you're put together. So internally, you then bring that through as an actor. 
and into the character. So what you're actually doing, and, and I didn't realize I was doing it, but coming from my acting background, I'd, I'd literally bring a character to life, you know, mm. as opposed to being a human in a suit. And I, I kind of really found that out when, um, when I was doing Narnia during the whole Lord of the Rings thing, I, I didn't really get it, but I, in Narnia, I, when I was playing one of the Minotaurs, um, I played General Lotman and, um, it, it was, it was, it was evident when I looked at the playback, the difference between what I was doing and what other people were doing. Um, yeah. and I've, yeah, I've, I've kind of made it my life now, but it's and that's the thing I love about um, what 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 Michael does is is that is that it shows the audience, you know, that and even the pain and the torture that yeah. people go through yeah. to, to to actually, you know, bring that thirty seconds of what they did onto the screen, you know. Well, it's fun. You're talking about again. I've had a little bit of an experience with the makeup. I got to be. Uh, a zombie in George Romero's Land of the Dead, which was a bucket list thing for me. I'd always wanted to do this. <laughs> and I got in the makeup chair, and the makeup guys were great people, and they were like, well, what do we want to do? It's like, look, you consider this a blank canvas. Uh, shave my head, shave my beard. I don't give a shit what you do. Just do yeah. whatever you want. And so that opened them up to go, oh, okay. And they said, well, my left eye is technically, I'm technically blind in my left eye, so it doesn't affect my death perception or anything. So gouge it out do whatever the hell you want. i don't care just you know do what you know and so putting it on was a fascinating process where it's like okay and then i spent we had some downtime and i just spent like an hour in the mirror just moving the stuff around and realizing mm -hmm. oh okay if i do this it causes the makeup to do that and i realized oh if i if i don't do this then you're not going to get any registration on that at all it was fascinating to see how instead of fighting it I tried to work with what it was and it ended yeah. up being much more successful that way. And so sometimes really arching your eyebrows and stuff did magic. And then other times it was way too much. And it's a very del. And I imagine you've gone through this way more than I have, where you have to figure out, okay, I need to act through this, but at the same time, I need to work it to my favor as well. Yeah. yeah and, and that's it. You've, 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 you've hit on a very good point there. It's a, you can't actually act the same every time in different makeups because no, like no, you said, no, some no. makeups, some makeups actually suppress what you're trying to do. So you actually have to overact right. to, to, to try and make it work. And then others actually accentuate your expressions. So then you have to dial it right back and do less is more, you know? Right. And then I would often it'd be a situation where the makeup it itself was so vivid you let that do the acting for you to some degree. Yeah. So it's like, I don't yeah. need to try to overdo this. It's going to just yeah. being still is enough. You know, it's, oh. it's a real, yeah. And so, I mean, and that, and again, I only did that a couple of times, did it on two movies and uh, compared to you, I mean, it's like a drop in the bucket. So I imagine you've really had to refine figuring out, okay, I'm going to have it here, here, and here before I had that. It worked like this, but this is, and it would help with me was that they were individual pieces. It wasn't like a mask that was thrown on me. Yeah. So I still I'll, have I'll, some I'll, range I'll, of movement. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a little tip um, and, and your audience a little tip um, just from years and years and years of experience. And I've done a couple of master classes on creature performance and, um, and motion capture as well. The, the most important thing out of everything, if you're a creature, is the breath. Mm. You know, I always, I always start my classes, my master classes, with breathing, mm. because it's it's that one thing that even if you're still in the face, in the face, the character still has to breathe. So if you're breathing as the character, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can be just sitting there doing nothing, just listening. But if mm. you're breathing as a character, the audience believes that character is alive. Right. Right. Whereas a lot of people that don't understand that. They think they have to act in the mask. Mm -hmm. It, you know, when 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 you take away the character, when you tell them to be still, they don't breathe, and all of a sudden, it just becomes a puppet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. When I saw guys on the set of on the Land of the Dead, where the you know trying to be zombies, and they were like, "Okay, you're you're trying to imitate what you've seen in other things. You're not listening to what George is really wanting you to do." And it was funny, and I, I have to cop to this because I was a, a disciple of George's films and his zombies. I knew how to do it. 
I've been practicing for years as a kid. I knew what I was doing. And I get to the <laughs> set, and the AD comes up to the whole group of us that are there, and he goes, all right, zombies, you're hungry. You need to do this and feel like this. And part of me, I, and I'm glad I stopped myself, but a part of me went almost wanted to go, dude, I got it. Just, <laughs> just, just you, 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 you're great. I love your energy, but shut up. Just sit down. Yeah. But unfortunately, I was like, no, 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 don't do that. And then it was, but it was funny to to just see how other people interpreted it, and then how George would come along and go, "Nah, you you too much. You got to just kind of you you you're you're dead. So you're not going to be able to spring into action like this." And so he would just tweak things, and then people would kind of get it. But yeah, it's like you can't just you know yeah. there are ten different zombies, ten different zombie movies. You line them up, there's going to be ten different directors wanting ten different things. So you yeah. don't can't just. I was a zombie in that movie, so that means I'll do the same thing here. It's like, no, not necessarily. No. That it's totally de project dependent. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Shane, so I'm gonna take it back just a little bit and uh, ask you, um, when did the whole movie thing start for you? Um, well, it, it it really depends on 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 what you're saying. Like my imagine my imagination started as I was a kid. You know, I was brought up on a farm. I only had me. So I'd go out, I'd saddle up my horse and I'd go out into the bush and and I, my imagination would just go wild. You know? um, but the whole the whole film thing, you know, I, I used to believe it or not, I used to love horrors. It was <laughs> one of those ones because um, because when I was born, I actually had really long eye teeth. I had to get them shaved off. Oh. And I actually thought I was sort of like a vampire or a werewolf. <laughs> and... Um, and so I used to stay up and watch horrors and then sort of like go out on a full moon after I've watched one to go out there and see, see what I could find. You know, <laughs> I was, I was actually one of those, one of those kids. And then, um, yeah, nothing, nothing really fazed me, but dude, I actually didn't get into filming that. I never, I thought I was going to be an, an all black. I thought I was going to be a sportsman. Sport was actually my avenue. It didn't matter what it was, rowing, hundred meters, athletics, um, rugby, you know, every kid here in New Zealand wants to be an All Black, and you know, I was I was pretty good. And then what happened was that I happened to be at school one 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 day at college, um, and my college is your guys' high school, I believe. Yeah. So so I was um I was at college and I was at rugby training and a dance teacher, Bruce Wilson. He was our drama teacher and dance teacher at, at Gisborne Boys. And um, he came to our rugby training and si and he wanted to start a dance troupe, but he didn't want your stereotypical dancers because I was at an all-boys school. Mm -hmm. And Gisborne, the Gisborne is is kind of a tougher area in New Zealand. <laughs> you know, So he didn't want your stereotypical dancers. He, he wanted people that were sportsmen so that when they were on stage – the boys would, would would you know would go well you know they they're one of our best rugby players and they're up there dancing so dance isn't that bad mm -hmm. you know he wanted to have a, a, a different outlook um and he came up to our rugby training one day and he said look i'm looking for dancers for our dance troupe and um if if you come and join the troupe i can all i can guarantee is that i can help you play sport better mm -hmm. and literally me and my mate me. Oh yeah. You know, any you go give anything a try to play sport better. So I went there, went along there, got in, and unbeknownst to me, if you're in the dance troupe, you had to do the school plays. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's literally how I got into theater and that. And then um film, believe it or not, I didn't get into film and that until Lord of the Rings came around along. I did theatre. I got into New Zealand drama school. Yeah, I did musicals. I did pantomimes and that um, when I was younger. Like, for instance, the first play I did was uh, Greece. Oh. And then from Greece, we did Jesus Christ Superstar. And then I went out after I finished that, after I finished school, still played rugby, um, did a whole lot of pantomimes. And then I got into New Zealand drama school, travelled down to Wellington. And then I had to make the choice between rugby and, and – um, and drama. I got into New Zealand drama school, and then I also got into a trial to become a sort of like a, a junior All Black, or we call them the All Black Colts, which is 21 and under. Mm -hmm. And drama school literally said, "What do you want to do? Do you want to be an actor, or do you want to play rugby?" Right. Because world let you go, 
but you can't come back to school. And it was, it was literally, it was up to me. And so I chose, I didn't think I was that good a rugby player. So I chose, I chose staying at drama school and then, yeah, and did theater. And then when Lord of the Rings came along is actually when I got into film. Wow. And, 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 and basically from there, I stayed in film simply because I love theater. Theater, you have that live connection with the audience. You know, if you want to make them laugh and they laugh, you know, you've won. If you want them to cry and you make them cry, you've won, you know. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't really pay the bills. And um, film, however, I discovered that if you're on a film set, you get free breakfast, free lunch, and you've got a craft table. And you get paid. It's a one right. round. Right, right, yeah. I'd like to bring up this comment here. I don't know if you guys can see it. Theater and I oh, saved, my, saved life. my life. The, yeah, yeah, they did for me. The, I certainly know in high school they did because I was in the drama department at high school and I was an outcast. I was a nerd. I didn't have a, um, a lot of friends, but my the drama department was my home. I spent all my time there. We did, I think, so, almost a dozen plays over the three years I was there. And it was a wonderful creative outlet for me. And it was a place to feel at home and safe at the same time. We were safe to try. Had a very liberal uh, uh, teacher there. Very, very liberal teacher who let us get away with a lot of crap. And so it felt very open and free. And it just gave me the opportunity. I mean, we did, a friend of mine, we got together. We did a sketch comedy TV show for public access while we were in high school. <laughs> I did a couple of short films when I was, I mean, Looking back on it, we were remarkably ambitious considering we had really no talent, experience, or money, or resources back then. I mean, this is like in 1990, 1991. We were lucky to be able to borrow a VHS camcorder back in the days. <laughs> now I see people making mo movies on their iPhone. I'm like, oh, go oh, fuck no. yourselves. I don't know. I could have made a billion dollars with an iPhone back in 1990. Where was this shit then? Um, but yeah, it's, right. Yeah. So, but no, that that the arts, and in many ways, what I've been doing for the last fifteen years, it's given me a creative outlet and a chance to meet people and people I never thought I'd ever get to meet. And to, I mean, it's been, um, it's one of those things where it's your passion. And it also becomes what you do for a living. That's rare. It doesn't happen to everybody. And so, when yeah. that does happen, you tend to hold on to it with both hands, and uh, that can be. Uh, it can, it's been insanely rewarding in very many ways, for, for sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's kind of funny though because when we talk about the art saving us, it was like we were our own group. Like I was, I was band geek in school, and if you make a flute joke right now, I'll kill somebody. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no. no. Uh, because I did, I marched flute and piccolo for four years, and so the whole big group of us also ran in the same circles as the theater groups and as the choir groups and everybody. So we all kind of intermixed a little bit mm -hmm. and there were athletes, you know, whatever, but yeah. who cares? Um, <laughs> sorry, but they all were part of it. Like, because we all kind of like were together in this thing that we loved mm -hmm. and it brought us all together and we were excited about it. And I think we are resource works extra resourceful people. Like if you oh, had yeah. no money and no resources and no talent, then you figure out what to do. Yeah, you because know, I think we, we, a lot it, of us had it. talent. I think a lot of us had talent back then, but we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We had no context for anything back then. It was just like we didn't know what we were doing. It was just like uh, <laughs> you know. And I, and I love the tech department of our high school. You know, people who build the sets and stuff like that. Looking back at it, there were so many code violations that we did. <laughs> and that's we built that should have. I'm like, he would build set extensions that would go up and like there was scaffolding and shit. And I'm like, oh my God, and we were running around bouncing off of that stuff like it was rock solid. I'm like, looking back at it, no, no, it was not rock solid. We should have died like 15 times over. But we were just like, we, we had all this energy and we had to put it into something because when you're that age, everything's dialed up to 11. So yeah. it's like, uh, what do I do with all this? Oh, let's build something. Oh, let's, what, okay, we built that thing. Now what do I do? Let's play on it. You know, it's just it was it was just uh, it was an interesting time to be alive, and I'm I'm surprised I got through it with all my limbs intact. Looking back at it, yeah, well, it's a, it sorry, but, uh, it's okay. It um it just it gives us an outlet, and then it helps you figure out what you really want to do. Like yeah. I've said this before on this show that. 
an upperclassman. He was two years older than me. He was a marching band. He and his friends would go out and make movies, you know, 1990s, like go out and make movies in the, in the park and did his own makeup effects. And he has been working on films in LA and he just, I mean, he worked on, he was one of the, the top designers for Teen Wolf, you know? So it's, cool. it's all, it, it sets you up to yeah, become he, whatever you're going to do. Yeah. He, he worked in, uh, on late to rest as well. Yeah, he worked on late to rest and he is working on other stuff too. Yeah. His but name is, uh, Eric Horn. He's all, and he's always been the guy that was the behind the scenes guy. You know, it's no recognition for any of what he wow. does. Like he doesn't even that they had a whole like behind the scenes makeup thing, the tutorial for, um, the teen wolf makeup. And he did part of it on his, he did post part of it on his Instagram, but he won't be part of any of those things where he has to be sitting in front of the camera. Right. He's like, I'll do it while I'm talking to you, but sure. I don't want, mm -hmm. I want it to be me. I want it to be what I'm doing. Yeah. And yeah. it's kind of, it's just really cool to see that, you know, if he hadn't been involved in arts and he hadn't had that group of friends that were excited and interested and wanted to do those sorts of things, he might never have made that happen. Well, what's interesting is that you mentioned, uh, uh, Shane, that, you know, you were into, you were a very athletic guy that you, you know, that was sort of like, your sorry, that wasn't a dig or anything. No. <laughs> oh, that's all right. But, but, but I must say, I, it took me a lot to hold back from mentioning band camp. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was because in high school we had a guy. Four years. I went four years. Yeah. In, in our drama department, we, we took all comers. We didn't really care if you wanted to do something. It was fine. And there was a guy uh, named John who was a football player, a big strapping football player. And he ended up doing a couple plays with us. He was the lead in the Crucible version that we did. And was he the greatest actor in the world? No, none of us were. But you know what? He, he wanted to do it. He was just like, I want to try this. I want to give this a, a chance. And you know what? By the end of it, he was actually really damn good. And it was just, but you know, it's just like, well, and, and I'm sure he got some shit from some of his friends and some some of the other people. What are the football? Are you going to go on stage and do lines and stuff? And he's like, and his whole attitude was like, yeah, it seems like something I, why not? He was a why not guy instead of a why guy, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that took a lot of, especially when you're in high school and it's all cliquey and people are talking behind your back. He was just like, no. And also, it didn't hurt the fact that he was this big strapping guy so that he could pound you into the ground like a railroad spike. <laughs> so if you, ever, if you ever dared make fun of him, we'd be like, "Oh, that's funny," and then that would be the end of you. So it yeah. was because uh, it was, it's, that was. I'll never forget. There was this one moment on stage. We, we were doing much ado about nothing, and at one point, he had to pick me up and kick me, and I'm supposed to kind of fly off stage. And in the first rehearsal we did of it, he said, "Well, I'm not going to actually kick you. I'm just going to kind of put my foot in your back and kind of shove you off because I don't want to actually." And so we, we was like, "Okay, fine." And he did it, and he, kicks, and he grabs me by the scruff of the neck, and he puts his foot, and he launches me, launches me across the stage. I go flying out of control over a big table that was off stage. I flip upside down and crash back against the wall and slide down. And I, he's like, oh, my God, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm good. We may need to rejigger this a little bit because I'm not doing this, <laughs> not doing this every night. Because uh, from the perspective, and I learned later from the perspective of the stage, it was like, yeah, one second you were on stage, and then in a blink of an eye, you were just gone. We didn't actually see what happened to you. So it was that was always fine. I always remember him for that. He was he was a good guy. He was a real good guy. Yeah, it's it's, it's funny. Yeah, we we all have um, different things. Like like I said, like I I was an athlete. I and and if if um, our drama teacher come and said he wanted to start a drama class. I probably wouldn't have gone because when I was when I was younger, I was actually really shy. I was quite an introvert, so so I was an artist. I I did a lot of art. Mm -hmm. I just used to like sitting there doing art stuff. Um, but what what getting into what getting into this and which is probably why, believe it or not, I love doing creature performance. Is is because I'm so, you know I'm still I'm actually still quite that that shy person, and mm -hmm. that. I don't like being the center of attention. And if I'm in prosthetics, no one knows who I am, you know? Right, right. right. Um, and, and, and for me, it was, it was just that thing of when I stepped on stage, I, I was no longer me. It was a mm -hmm. release for me to, to actually be someone else. 
Um, and and that that to me is 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 what theatre and the arts did for me. You know, it, it just totally brought me out mm-hmm. of of being an introvert and actually excelling in something that I actually did love to do. And and when I had that connection with the audience, it, it you know having that connect because I can't really I couldn't really connect because I was so shy mm-hmm. um, because you know. Because for a whole lot of reasons like but most of it was around speech like i had a really bad speech impediment and i had a really bad stutter and Mm -hmm. thick tongue and i couldn't really speak um so so i kind of chose not to and and i always wore a cap and you know no one ever saw my face and stuff like that and and it was just one of those things that when i actually got that connection with the audience from doing theater it actually just sort of like struck a match inside me Mm-hmm. And 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 so I I then carried it on, but it is one of those ones that like one of the hardest acting gigs I ever did was um I was in the TV series um, Spartacus done by Stars oh, yeah. and and I played a character called Dagon and um uh, which was in the in, in the prequel so they did um, Blood and Sand which was the first one and then they did Gods of the Arena which was a prequel because Andy was going through his treatment. And I remember vividly, I walked into wardrobe and it was the first time I'd ever walked into wardrobe and come out of wardrobe wearing less than what I went in with, <laughs> you know, and for, for two weeks, I was just, I was just so uncomfortable of being on set because literally I was just in a loincloth, you know, right. um, and whereas I'm, I'm used to getting, you know, big animatronic heads put on right. me. And, yeah. Yeah, you know, no one can see what I look like, but here I was just everything. And 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 the other thing that you know that I probably loved about creature performance is that if the director doesn't like something you're doing, it's normally because either the suit's prohibiting you, you know, like you can't see your eye lines not right because you don't, you can't see where your marks are. Everything's right. just muscle memory, or you're doing something not big enough, or you're doing something too big because of the suit. Mate, when you're in a loincloth and the director doesn't like what you, he doesn't like what you're doing. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It becomes very personal. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, let me uh, throw this at you. Um, when did the whole like behind the scenes uh, start for for Hollywood? Like when when did all that start? Um, I know we would talk off camera about Laserdisc being like where it really kind of launched to the public yeah i mean there's always been you know set visits and little things done for shows like entertainment tonight and the local news and things that would get syndicated but they were puff pieces they were like hey we're making a movie that's great and here's the big stars and blah 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 and they gotta go through it but in terms of, in terms of uh I, I guess your dog disagrees with me on this i want to hear, hear his opinion on it what the hell is this quarantine has like since everybody's here yeah. He's on high alert all the time. So somebody drives down our little cul-de-sac and he's at the window barking at whatever the car is, whether it even makes it all the way down the street or not. So, <laughs> But in terms of, uh, well, anyway, in terms of like home video, when home video came along, uh, the idea of doing commentary tracks and including trailers and, you know, interviews and stuff like that really began with Laserdisc and it began like the Criterion Collection was one of the first companies to really do that on a reliable basis because their job was to present things to collectors, to film collectors who wanted that information, who wanted to get that. And Laserdisc became a collector's format. It started off as a as a home video competitor of VHS and beta, but it didn't really work out that way. But uh, video files and audio files love the improved clarity of that format. And so the high-end people began to kind of gravitate that and that also meant the collectors went there and so laserdisc really became the 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 foreground for first seeing commentary tracks and that and even the but the major studios didn't even really catch on to that until right you know much later um and then when dvd came along they brought that with them but it was a lot of independent companies like criterion and elite entertainment back then who took genre product and said oh we don't we can do you know, special editions of titles like Night of the Living Dead and Reanimator and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And also that, that format, Laserdisc, was where you saw widescreen presentations for the first time. 
you know, films in their original aspect ratio, you know, no, people were like, what the hell is this with the black bars? But, you know, collectors understood, well, this is how they saw it in the theater. And so that's really where it began. Laserdisc was really, without Laserdisc, uh, DVD, I'm sure would have come along eventually, but it wouldn't have been treated with, the, you know, the idea of having, oh, well, we can put commentary tracks and deleted scenes and all this stuff on there because Laserdisc had set the groundwork for that. Yeah. Do you think the laser disc didn't work because uh, they were the size of records? Well, there you know, was that. There was that. The players were expensive. You couldn't record to them. That was one thing you couldn't do. And they were they were fragile compared to say. I mean, even not that not that VHS was durable in any way, shape, or form. But uh, you know, laser discs were hard to rent. I mean, they could you could break them. They could warp. They could you know there's any number of things, and they were a lot more expensive. Uh, it was just it was not a very it was not a format that lent itself well to a rental market. You needed something that could take a lot of abuse, and Laserdisc could not take a lot of abuse. And again, because you couldn't record to the format, it meant it was another format you had to have in your house that was only for movies and nothing else. Whereas with a VHS player, you could take your soap operas or whatever the hell you wanted to on television and rent movies and do whatever you wanted. So uh, Laserdisc ended up just being, again, something that, gravitated towards collectors and people who had a hi-fi a really great sound system and really top-notch you know televisions back then and laserdisc offered a big upgrade to what you could get on vhs and beta yeah this is what uh rick bradley has said yeah laserdisc was ahead of its time and the tech just wasn't yeah it wasn't affordable the first it was weird my dad actually was an early adopter of laserdisc we had a laserdisc player for five years before we had a vcr and the, the first Laserdisc player he brought home weighed more than my car weighs now. And it was it was this big unit where you had a top loader that would load up. You put the disc in and shut it. And then you would turn on the power and hit play. And it would sound like the CERN Super Collider turning on. And it was like... <laughs> You'd be like, "What the hell is going to happen here?" And so it was, uh, it was, it was like you could even go ka-chung. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's like, okay, this thing's either going to fly out of here, or the whole house is going to melt down. It's like the but, uh, and, then, <laughs> and another, and another annoying thing with laziness was that there were side breaks. You had to get up every forty-five minutes and turn the thing over because it could only hold like forty-five minutes of information. As, as a result, there's about ten films from my childhood that the side break is so ingrained in my head that whenever I watch them now, I still start to get up. <laughs> like, it's still instinctive in me. It's like, oh, that's no, that's right. I haven't watched this on Laserdisc in 30 years. But it's still... So Laserdisc had a lot going against it, but in terms of the, the visual and audio quality of it, it, back then it was the best it was by quite a while, by quite a mile, actually. Yeah, my first experience uh, was I had a friend had a pretty decent sized collection so we would watch like films the original star wars trilogy oh, sure. yeah yeah uh aliens and the abyss yeah oh wow oh yeah yeah back then they would even do box sets of some of these things and uh you know but then like the sound i remember robocop sounding amazing on laser disc i mean that one was one of those ones where it's like oh compared to vhs the vhs might as well not even have sound on it compared to this i mean this was amazing because you would get surround sound and AC3 and 5.1s and stuff. You couldn't get that on tape. You know, so when, when DVD came, it was, it was amazing. When DVD came along, VHS continued on for another, oh, good seven or eight years before it was really kind of over for VHS. Laserdisc died that day. Laserdisc was literally dragged out into the street and shot in the head. I have never seen a format die so quickly because when because now you had Everything that Laserdisc had, even in better quality, and it was this size, and it was cheaper. Well, what the hell do we need Laserdisc for? So Laserdisc was was executed. It was not a format that died. It was executed. And uh, I, I've never seen a format that – and I always felt a little bit bad about that. But I always felt, I was like, no, Laserdisc did its job, and it's coming. Yeah. It's, it did its job. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, – I, I always have a lot of affection for that format, an, an incredible amount of affection. Yeah. Well, I think Laserdisc was sort of like the foundation for 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 DVDs and, and it was and, and stuff, you know, be, be, because like you said, it was so big. But that format, you know, you could see the the sound quality and you can see the um the 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 visual quality so much better. 
that that but it was just the size and, and the amount so so when and the amount of information that you you could get on a on on a compact disc on yeah on a blu-ray and you know it was just on a dvd was just phenomenal yeah and they were like yeah. they were you know you could yeah and with dvds it was perfect for rental market because you could just shove i mean it was a dvd had so many advantages over laser disc it was almost kind of laughable it was just like it was perfect but uh, it was, uh, and when the thing about Laserdisc that for me was so important was that I got to see movies in widescreen properly mm -hmm. for the first time. And I got to learn about what aspect ratios were and why they were formatted. I'll never forget watching, because I, I you know, saw Return of the Jedi in theaters probably about five or six times. And then I watched the Laserdisc of it that my dad bought, which was still pan and scan. And then I got used to it that way. And then years later, I finally got a widescreen version of that movie. And there was a shot I'll never forget of uh, Lando Calrissian in the cockpit of Millennium Falcon that for years was just on him. That was all I ever saw. And then seeing the widescreen version, it's him, a co-pilot, the navigator, a mariachi band, and like 15 other people that are in the cockpit with him. I'm like, where the hell have these people been all this time? Oh my God, I was missing all this fucking information. So it was, Laserdisc was good, not just in terms of the sound and the picture quality and the extras, but it's just a, a, to educate you on what films, how they're supposed to be presented. Yeah. It was yeah. really important. Yeah. I wonder if uh, Hollywood was also looking at um, the music industry with the CD and being, oh, you know, sure. oh, they were like, well, they're selling a whole bunch of those. You know, I wonder how we could take the laser disc and shrink it to that size. Oh, there was, I mean, that had been something I'm sure that had been on their mind. They were always like, Video formats come and go, and everything moves so fast. It's like dog years. It's like yeah. uh, there's always the, the, what's the next thing? What's the and, and and from a very cynical standpoint, Hollywood's like, how can we get you to buy this again? You know, there's a joke in Men in Black that I've always loved when they walk into this technology room and it says like Tommy Lee Jones picks up this little tiny thing and goes, yeah, these things are going to replace CDs in a few years. I guess I'll have to buy the White Album again. So it's like every. <laughs> They're always trying to figure out another way to make you buy shit that you've already bought. So right now we're going through that with Ultra HD with 4K. So now it's like, oh god, I gotta buy you know Star Wars again because now it's in 4K and it's something. So uh, yeah, it didn't surprise me as soon as I saw C my I, my first CD I ever bought was the pet, oddly enough the Pet Cemetery soundtrack. Don't ask me why it was that, but it was. <laughs> uh, but I remember listening to it and hearing how clear it was, and, how, and then looking at the disc, and I was like, who's they can get a movie on this? It's going to be something else. And it didn't happen for another eight years, but it, it did happen. Yeah. Yeah. Was it 97, I think, is when DVDs. 97, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was when they first, and then they, they only went to a few stores, there were only a few titles, and they all got gobbled up really fast. And then the studios all went, oh, okay, there's money to be made here. Yeah, we'll do that. You know, so it was. It was interesting. Yeah, my uh, favorite store at that time was one of those, and that was Suncoast Motion Picture Company. Oh, yeah, Suncoast. I remember Suncoast. Yeah, they had all that stuff back then. That's where you could go to get like some of Anchor Bay's early tapes and stuff like that because they were the only ones that would carry that stuff because they, they had a really good horror section. And uh, uh, it was, yeah, those were the days, man, when you actually go out and buy something at a store. I remember what those were like. Yeah, uh, so that, then that kind of leads into the next thing. Um, with what you do, and um, also Shane as an as an actor and all that, uh, how do you feel about the importance of physical media versus streaming and all that? Well, Shane, why don't you go first on this one? Why don't you tell me what you think? Well, you know, it's funny. It, I was actually going it, to. It does tie in quite quite nicely because it it is that whole thing of you know. The, the whole e even from a filming aspect like like for instance when we did lord of the rings right that was all shot on film mm -hmm. so it was a uh, thousand feet to a can and to 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 process it it was like a dollar 12 cents a foot um and depending on what speed you went that the can would either last you between between five minutes and you know probably about 30 seconds depending on what your frame rate was what speed you were shooting at right now now what it meant was that you you actually had to get what you wanted and in, in that yeah you 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 really had to know what you wanted to shoot what your shots were 
and 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 just go for it. Whereas now that we've shot, we've we've now changed to a digital format. It's 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 one of those ones where you can just keep going until your card runs out, right? And then you just put in a new card. Um, and and Peter Jackson, Peter Jackson is notorious for it. And that when we were doing the Hobbit, like we he he believed in just shooting a whole scene, like. I, I don't know if any of you guys have seen The Hobbit, but there was a um, when we did the goblins down and we had the doors and we'd take them around the tracks. Literally, we just had a big long track and it'd loop around. We did that one time for look, I can't even remember how many takes it was. We just kept going round and round and round. I, I think it was like something like forty minutes. Wow. We just kept going round and round and round and round until the card ran out <laughs> and guys had guys had pass out oh. now and and then and then all of a sudden what happened is that when the film came out you look at it they weren't even real they they were all digital right now now it's it's for me I'm I'm a purist in that when I like I love 4K in that on on my television and that and you know and and I love the the depths and the colors that you can get now but I still like grain yeah, in a film. yeah, you know, I still love the sim- cinematography of having grain, right. you know, having, and it's the same, believe it or not, it's the same with music. You know, when we talk about compact discs, mm-hmm. yeah, compact discs are great, but I still love the sound of putting a needle on a record, right, right, right. and still having that that noise at, at the back. So, you know, I'm old school, I've, I've, I've come from an old school format and coming through. And, and and to me, you know, the on-stream media, you, you know, it's it's one of those ones. It's it's one, it's it's like I love the fact I I miss going to a, a DVD to to like, like a video store to hire out, you know, to go there and look and see people's recommendations, turn it over, read the back of it, right? You know, it's that physical contact thing with me going home and you know and putting out, you know the the pain in the butt thing is that you have to take it back. Otherwise you get charged right. with a yeah, fee. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's one of those ones where as um, on demand, it's, 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 you know, it, it's one of those ones that all of a sudden, if you had a power cut, you know, it's, it's gone. If your internet goes down, you, you're gone. You know, yeah. if, if you have buffering issues, it's gone. You right. know, I watch, you know, you know, I'm, I'm totally into UFC and um, USC TV. You know, I'm, a, I'm a subscribed member to them, but you, you're watching it sometimes and then all of a sudden it stops and it buffers and you're just going, what the, you know, you just start throwing up. You know, it's, and, and, and it's funny because as technology gets better, you expect more from it. Right. Like, yeah. like I've got a, I've got a, I've got a Dolby Atmos um sound system set up and honestly i'm watching tv stuff and you know stuff's coming through the rear i'm going oh my gosh that's amazing and then all of a sudden a program comes on that doesn't have it and i'm just like i'm chucking my toys out of the cot you know it's just i'm being ripped off i'm being ripped off and 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 it's one of those ones that you know i'm i'm all for i'm all for it but at the same time I'm, you know, there's pros and cons with, with both. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd like to find a happy medium. You know, with, with 4K, like Hobbit, I'll, I'll be brutally honest. I actually didn't like the way it was shot. It was so clean. Yeah. It felt like a home video camera to me, you know? Wasn't that one shot the same way as uh, Gemini Man in a full, like, the... FPS? I think that's what it's called. Yeah, he shot like 48 frames a second. Yeah, something. 48, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the thing I loved about it was the depth of field that when you saw the mountains in the back, you just had all that detail. It was phenomenal. Right. But at the same time, you know, half the time you're not looking at at the back right. of the shot. You're looking right. at what's in front, and and it just it just made it too clean for me, you know. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, 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 I I'm, I'm conflicted. So yeah, there, no, there you go, Michael. You've asked me to answer it first, and I I was no help. So where you go, you answer it properly. <laughs> No, it is a conflicting thing because there are certain things that I love having on streaming that I don't need to have every episode of a television show on my shelf. 
I don't need to have certain things because, you know, and I know that they're always going to be available in one form or another out there. So it's not like they'll ever be deprived. But, you know, when I want some of my favorite movies and I want to know how they made them and see the special features and get the trailers yeah. and stuff like that, that's not really, the, the, the online hasn't really known what to do with any of that stuff yet. And as far as the technology is concerned with what I do, you know, it's funny. When I first started, I was shooting onto mini DV tapes and still using tape formats. And I was fine with that. And then the first film I ever uh, shot I was on George Romero's Diary of the Dead, the DP I worked with on there said, we're working with the Sony camera and we're shooting onto these cards. And then you'll download them onto your computer. And I'm like, ah, uh, ooh, I don't like this. Because well, where is the footage? If it's not on the tape, where is it? I don't understand this. This, uh, I just like, this is just within two weeks, I was so thrilled with the digital format that I'm like, I'm never shooting on tapes again. This is like <laughs> the best thing I've ever, I'm like, and I've, since I've never gone back because it was just yeah. like, this is too perfect too. Yes, things can happen, but compared to tapes, I'm, this is, yeah. oh my God. So it was like, uh, so on the one hand, I want the technology to continue to improve and get better, but I don't want it to become a situation where we all rely on just one source for this stuff because mm that can be dangerous and that can also limit your choices. And I never want to be in a situation where I can't watch uh, like road to perdition with Tom Hanks right now. And I've got it sitting right over here. Now it's online, but I know it's right here and I don't know if it's going to be online next week when I want it. So it's, it's, you know, there's just times where I think there's, there needs to always be, like I said earlier, when we were off camera, Physical media is not going anywhere. It's always going to be around. Yeah. What to what it may just end up becoming what, what Laserdiscs were back in the eighties, a, a thing for the collector's market, for the people who want it. You'll charge a little bit more, but you'll get the this really great archival format that you can have on your shelf. Um, but you know, I don't think it's I, I, anyone who says they know what's gonna happen for sure is full of shit because you see these articles every year. We're like, well, that's it for physical media. It's like, this is the same article I saw in 2000 and in 1990. And it's like, you, no one knows a, a thing. So, you know, 10 years from now, we'll maybe be talking about, remember when we watched movies online instead of having a little chip in our heads? Wasn't that something? You know, so, I mean, we're going to, we, no one really knows. But I think it's all, the physical media uh, is always going to be around in some fashion or another, I think. Yeah, and, and, and I totally agree with you. I mean, if you, if you look at it out of context, well, it's not really out of context, but if you take it from a book's point of view, mm -hmm. you know, that's just like saying, well, you know, books are, books are now long. No one's ever going to make or, or, or buy books anymore because you can just, you know, you've got a Palm Pilot or you've got right. audio books or whatever. But no, it's, it's exactly the opposite. You know, people still still want that physical format. You know, they, they, they still want it that you can just go and, and, and I'll be not that I'm a book reader, but man, I actually find it really hard reading something off a digital screen. It, yeah, it is for me too. It's you know, and, and, and it's same with me writing. Like I've been writing my new project and, and I, I can't actually type because I'm not a top touch typist. I actually have to write by hand because wow. for me, it just flows so much better onto the page. Mm -hmm. And my ideas are just going, I think it's from my art format, you know, doing my art. Whereas, <laughs> yeah. whereas when, when I'm typing, man, I'm just like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Nicole. Now yeah. coming from an educator's perspective, this is just a thing. Part of your brain, the part of your brain that does stuff on paper and reads from paper is a different part of your brain than what reads off of a digital screen. So you're actually taking in the information differently and processing it differently. Oh, yeah. So my friends will sit at the computer <laughs> and they'll type away. They're typing, typing, typing. Yeah. My 64-page my thesis is in a notebook just like this. Huh. Written and then typed and proofread yeah. because I could not just sit there and do what all my friends were doing. Like, my, hmm. my brain doesn't work that way. Yeah, but same. I have a Kindle. I have a Kindle that I really don't read many books on because I'd rather read the book right here. Yeah. Online courses, same thing. I don't want to read the book on just let me print the stupid thing or let me buy this thing. You know, like, then it's here, then it's mine. I can consume yeah. it the way I need to consume it. But I think and, movies are and, the same. Yeah, and, and I think with movies, the cool thing about movies about about having the hard, hard, hard copy 
it, you know, you can go out and buy the hard copy, is that you're not restricted by by the networks. You know, mm-hmm. during lockdown, during lockdown, someone said to me, "Oh, have you seen such and such?" I went, "No," looked it up. You know, all the all all the media networks, streaming networks I had didn't have it. They were on the one one network that I didn't have. So now I have to now buy another subscription to then watch that. You know, it's yeah, it's it's you know, yeah. there's there's so many people have, have all got you know, it's it's not like movies where if Blockbuster had one and Video Easy had the other, you know, you know, you you had to go to one or the other. No, they all had the movie. You just chose whichever store you wanted to go to and you could get it. Whereas online format doesn't work like that you know right. you, you know certain people have certain stuff and certain content and you've got to go to them and you've got to buy this and yeah i have every i have every season of supernatural on on blu-ray, blu-ray except yeah. for 14 14 right we don't have 14 they did 14 seasons of that I have well, we have 15, 15, but 15 is the end. But I have, yeah. and I only have 15 on, we have a digital, right? Yeah. So we have fif- 14 digital and we have 15 digital, right? Right? I don't know. I don't know either. All I know <laughs> is packed. They have lots. I mean, I've literally packed the thousand DVDs we have in the living room right now mm-hmm. four times when we've moved. So that part of me is not so happy about physical media. Yeah. But the part of me that can pull 10 things I hate about you off the shelf and watch it whenever the hell I want. Right. Yeah. Is the part of me that loves it because that's also, nice. Yeah, and also the quality is better. As good as streaming is, yeah. 4K yeah. streaming compared to 4K Ultra HD, it's not even oh. the same ballpark. It's not even yeah. the same. It's not even close. No, not even. And we're not going to get to those abilities to get that kind of quality with the streaming technology we have now, now for quite some time. And even then, I don't know if we're going to get there because the ban- there's only so much bandwidth out there. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, the Internet, there's less, less demand on the Internet every year. No, it, it grows exponentially to the point where we're so reliant on the Internet to control every single thing in our house. Yeah. There's just no way to not allot enough bandwidth to have, you know, nearly uncompressed 4K streaming. It's just not going to, yeah. it's not a reality anytime in our near future. Well, and but the also, fact- it- sorry. No, 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 have, no, you go, Nicole. We have so much. I mean, we have so much in the way of like how much speed we can have as far as our as far as our internet. And only this year during quarantine, digital learning and all the things that were happening, you realize how many people actually have access to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when the cert when the bandwidth is filled, like the amount of people that are constantly on it, even our in our small town or even through Spectrum or whatever server you're using. There is a lag time. There is severe deficiencies to that. Uh, that I mean, oh, yeah. we've had our cable go out more times just since March than ever in the five years we've lived down here. So yeah. I lucked yeah. out like, like two years ago, maybe not even two years ago. They put fiber optic through my neighborhood. And so now I've got a fiber optic connection, which is light years ahead of what I had. But even it slows down at times, and that's the yeah. top of the top. So that that's you know I feel bad for anyone who's dealing with, you know, just a regular cable connection or a DSL. It's like there's just not enough slices of pie to go around, unfortunately. At the end of the day, yeah, and 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 that's what I was saying about before. You know, as technology gets more, we expect more from it. You right. know, it's a, like 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 I got fiber optic as well, and during uh-huh. lockdown, I was I was sitting there and I was just like. Woo! And then all of a sudden it, it start it start buffering or, or clicking or right. and, and I'm just like, what's up with this? Why? <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, this should not be doing this. Right. You know? and, and it's yet, just because and yet if you could show yourself ten years ago this, you'd be like, What the hell are you complaining about? Oh, oh my god. Well, well no, exactly. You know, ten years ago, you know, when when you had the old streaming and, and it was oh, just yeah. like going literally frame by frame, you know, I freeze know. frame, freeze frame, and you were going, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and now it seems like, you know, like caveman days. I mean, it's just like, come on. Yeah. It's just like, remember when you had a computer and you got a a fifty six K modem? Wow. Wow. Oh my <laughs> god. I mean, although yeah. you got a hard drive. This is a 256 megabyte hard drive. I'm never going to use all that up. Oh my oh, god! Man. Super easy. Well, 
it's yeah, just, exactly. It, it's ridiculous. But 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 I I I think for me as well the the thing with um with um Blu-rays and um and you know and DVDs and stuff like that, the thing I do love about them is that you know you, on on average I don't know what it is over there in in in, in the US, but over here on on average for a Blu-ray you're paying about thirty nine New Zealand dollars, forty New Zealand mm-hmm. dollars, which is probably around about twenty. Twenty nine dollars mm-hmm. American, yeah. You know, but 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 the thing about it is that you watch the movie, you know, you love the movie. You can watch the movie whenever you want. But then you've got the stuff that Michael does. You know, you've got the behind the scenes that mm-hmm. you, you can then go and watch. Then you've also got the movie again, but then with the director and the actors' commentary, right? Yeah, yeah. The scenes. So it adds a whole new dimension to the movie. You know, you're sitting there watching the scenes and you're there hearing the director about what he was thinking about the scene. You hear the mm-hmm. actors talking about what they were thinking about going through it, you know, and, and just the behind the scenes stuff that you get on a Blu-ray or a DVD is to me is, is, is an experience within itself, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it it really is, you know, and and luckily for me, especially with the Blu-rays and that, you know, um, like Disney and um, Walden, they they did Prince Caspian, and um, like I didn't even know they they did a behind the scenes, a seven minute behind the scenes um, Easter egg mm-hmm. on the Blu-ray, just just about me, and right. and it wasn't until someone actually bought the Blu-ray. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, and and their whole thing is to go through the whole thing to, to <laughs> right. find the Easter eggs, you know, right, to, right. to to find those little speeches, and and they email. Well, they they messaged me on 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 um, social media and said, "Oh my gosh, have you seen the the Easter egg that's been done on you?" And I was just like, "No, I haven't," you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, that 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 becomes the the you know it. It, it just makes it exciting, you know, if you get a Blu-ray and you know these special features hidden that you have to try and find and unlock. It's, you know, it's it, it makes a whole experience. Yeah, just, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Whereas online, on media, you know, half the time, you can't even read the, um, you can't even read the credits on it. No. You no. know? You go, no. oh, I, you know, because I, I love, yeah, you know, I, I, I do stunts. And all way through. Yeah, yeah, you know? just, it's yeah. just like, yeah, I'm just like, oh my gosh, who did the stunts in this? Who was the stunt team? And I get there, and I'm just like, it's if, if even if it goes through it, that's normally the quality all of a sudden it's gone from 4K to you know, to to, to the, the point no four. yeah, you know, and it's all blurry. And I'm just like, who the hell is that, right? I, yeah, it's just like, yeah, yeah. It, it it definitely it definitely has its there's definitely pros and cons you know but yeah I'm yeah. I'm I'm I still think... old school and yeah you know, I still love going to a theater I know, you know? yeah exactly yeah yeah but that's the whole but that's the whole thing about like the the magic of the situation like I am not a TV sports watcher mm-hmm. but if we go to a game that's totally different. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. go to, a, go to a, an event. It's a lot different yeah. than seeing it at home, and that's the same with film, I think. But yeah. it's also the same with like the behind the scenes stuff. Like, I think how old were we when um, Thriller came out? Uh, four. Four. Thank you. Okay, I was four years old, and yeah. I watched Thriller. I can't. I, I think between that and it, two years later, probably ruined my <laughs> entire like childhood. Right. And both of those things scared the hell out of me. Like I was terrified. And I, I mean, I knew that werewolves weren't real, but I was four. So in my head, I, I didn't understand. So as I was like 12 and 13 and I saw the behind the scenes stuff about how they did the makeup and how it was yeah. shot and, you know, you see the transformation and all that. So it was really cool. And I was like, oh, well, I'm not scared anymore. But there's that whole like dissecting the magic after you've watched and you're like yeah. a human being did this. Like right. they created right. that world that scared the bejesus out of me when I was four. Yeah. And, you know, and it's not just, I mean, we always talk about makeup and whatever, but it's a lot of other things that scare us too. Like if I watched, if I watched it without certain lighting and I watched without sound and I watched it without certain things that would be, oh, yeah. 
you know, lackluster. And so all of those people deserve to have their, you know, spotlight, like, oh, yeah, you know, oh, yeah. sure. and you get that when you get a documentary or, or a little, even if it's like a little snippet, like I always love the gag reel of anything that I watch. Oh, because, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and you're watching something that's serious, like, like you're watching a serious drama or a serious TV show where something's happening, but you have somebody who can't get the line right, or they play right. a practical joke on somebody. And that brings yeah. you closer to the people you already love so much on that show or in that movie. And so you get really excited about how they were on set because you want to be as close to those characters as possible. Right. Right. But also yeah. it makes the people that are filming it a whole lot more real, you know, like yeah. if yeah. they got along, if they had that chemistry, you know, like what they thought about it, like that, those are important things that I think if you're a real, like a real movie, movie fan, then you are yeah. excited about. Yeah. I agree. Well, well, what I love about the gag reels in that as well, especially when they're, um, yeah, on on the set, and you know, and and I've I've, I've been lucky enough to uh, be in quite a few gag reels, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but it's 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 when you're watching them, and yeah, and you've only got the two characters on set, and then someone fluffs up a line, but then you hear the raucous laughter oh, the people, of yeah, everyone yeah. behind. It yeah. just, oh, it's just, it's great because it really does give them, you know, because it's. That's that's the unfortunate thing is that the audience doesn't see. Sure, you've got two actors here, but you've got ninety-two behind them making all that magic work. You know, right, right. I I kind of have to agree <laughs> with Terry here. Oh, the Jackie Chan movies gag reels have got to be the best. They are very good because not only are they funny, but you really see how much he hurts himself each and every time. Yeah. Out. Because almost all his gag reels are where the stunts go horribly wrong. Yeah. And so it's just like, oh, good lord, how is that man not dead? You know, it's just, yeah. It, it's, yeah, those are pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I say certain things like Scream Factory, uh, which is owned by Shout, and there's Arrow Video. You mentioned Criterion. Uh, for us to keep those alive is we just keep purchasing uh, yeah. what they're doing because they have lots of great titles and uh, if there's a demand there'll always be a supply. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, yeah. you just have to support. I mean, you support with your passion for it, but then on a on a simple basic level, you support with your wallet. You know, you show the studios what you want, and they'll keep making it. It was a joke that we always had. When I worked at Anchor Bay Entertainment back in the day, we released Army of Darkness, I think, 17 times or something like that. We repacked well, it, it, isn't it like up to a million now or something? I don't know. It's a lot. But we mm -hmm. back then, we repackaged that movie and <clears throat> resold it more times than I care to count. And I can't tell you how many people would complain to us and say, you're selling Army of Darkness again? What? It's a blah, 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 blah. And I kept having to tell them. I said, look, Every time we do that, people buy it. It's supply and demand. We're not doing this and then no one's buying it. We're, we're buying it because people are saying, our customers are coming to us saying, hey, you know, Army of Darkness, we want more of that. So we would sell more of that. And it's like, you pay, you, you know, if there, if people weren't interested in buying it, then we, trust me, we wouldn't be making it again. Uh, so it's a situation where, People vote with their wallets, and and trust me, the people, the studios are watching. The distributors are watching where the money's going, and if they see it going towards something like this, then they're going to make more of that thing. So, if you keep buying the special editions and the and the horror titles and the cult titles, the, it's simple economics. The, 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 these companies are going to go, oh, these this is making money. Let's keep doing that because it just makes perfect sense. I got two questions for you, Michael. Um, is there a cult title or a horror title out there that you haven't done and that like it hasn't been released that you would love uh, to work on? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are you allowed to say not, what that I'm title say, is? I'm not going to say what it is because then somebody out there is going to go, oh, he wants to do that one. No, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jinx it if I say that. But yes, there are... <laughs> there are there are several, there are actually several, but uh, as the years go by, there are fewer and fewer because I've gotten to work on some amazing stuff. Uh, but no, there's a couple out there that I definitely would love to see. Uh, and then 
Uh, the next question then leads on, since you've done so much, is there something that stands out that you're really proud of? Oh, shit. Uh, I've done over 250 different Blu-ray releases, DVD releases since I started doing this. And it's been... I've had more good fortune and more good luck in my career doing this than I really deserve. So at the end of the day... <laughs> You know, the, you know, Creep Show was a big one for me. Uh, effects that I mentioned before, Texas Chainsaw Massacre one and two, uh, Monster Squad was a huge one for me. Uh, getting to work with George on the Diary of the Dead and uh, 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 Maximum Overdrive, uh, a little one, one I did called Mosquito was a really important one because that was all made here in Michigan, and so I got to kind of you know deal with people who were local to this area and their story of what it that's, was. That's that's a true story too yeah like, yeah, to God. yeah yeah and then like maximum overdrive i did a couple of years ago and that movie meant a lot to me as a kid so to be able to go in and tell the story of that movie meant a lot so it, it's each one has its own rewards i've you know there have been some i've done for movies that i actively don't like and in some cases some movies i actively despised but it became less about the movie itself than the people who made it and that's where you find the gold. You find this, oh man, okay. Like I did one for a, a movie called Faces of Death years ago. And Faces of Death was always this underground thing that it's got real death in it. And it's just this, you know, collection of uh, video and film footage of horrible things happening to people all over the world. And I saw it when I was a kid and I thought it was stupid and lame and I really hated it. But then they hired me to do a special edition of it. And I learned from the director and the editor about how much they... Craft went into taking a bit of real footage, augmenting it with fake stuff, and turning it into something completely different, or how they would do... I mean, it was like, wow, I'm learning a lot about the filmmaking craft from this. The final product is not something I'd ever really want to watch again, but I'm really glad I learned how these guys put this stuff together. So it's, it's less about the end product sometimes than it is just about the process. That's really... And then to be able to document that and have it recorded somewhere... Now, I've been doing this for 15 years now, and a lot of the people, not a lot, but a fair amount of the people that I've worked with on some of these things are gone now. They've passed away. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity to have talked to them is not available anymore. But so thank God I was able to get some of that. And that was really... Uh, so it's I, I view it as a privilege and an honor to be able to do this. And the fact that it's something that I love doing is um, kind of like a bonus in a way. Shane, what about you? Is there... Um... A piece of work that that you're super proud of that you've done um man uh you you know i just i'm i'm just grateful for whatever i do you know when when, when you're a performer in the arts you know you've you every every job that i've gotten i've been proud of of getting um and and I always give two hundred percent. You know, I I'd, I'd, I'd probably say um, for me, um, uh, something that I've done that's that's close close to my heart, and and that I'll always it's Lion Witch in the Wardrobe, mm. only because it's the only book I ever read as a kid. Oh wow! You know, so yeah. so and 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 for me, it, it like like. Like I've I've worked on so many so many things and I've worked with so many so amazing people, but Lion Witch in the Wardrobe when when I got cast in it and I was flying up to Auckland to do the first show and tell of General Lotman, I was sitting on the plane going up there at twenty nine thousand feet flying up to Auckland. I looked out the window and the sun was just hit, hitting the land in a way that I had this deja vu of me being nine years old mm. back in the classroom lying on the rug reading the book and it just it just dawned on me like i was just like wow i would never have thought back right. then yeah. i'd be in the movie of the book that i was just reading you know yeah. um and then another piece of work that that you know i'm, I'm i really in, enjoy doing is um well, it's, it's actually what what you know Michael said before was um, we we did a sh uh, a little short film called Die Like a Shark, um, which is done on a Maori fakatoki or proverb called um, <laughs> "Koe mate feki me mate ururo," don't die like an octopus, die like a shark. <laughs> um, 
and um and and yeah you know we we the the the, the struggle that we had to to do that was just getting it from script we submitted it to the film commissions to try and get funding they wanted to make too many changes you know and and that's the trouble is is that you don't realize how much control you have to hand over to someone else right. if you want money to make the film that you've you're trying to do you know and and so in the end basically me and my buddy just said look you know what we'll, we'll, we'll just do it ourselves so we we did a short film and it looks you know it's doing the festival circuit at the moment and it's it's doing pretty well but we, if you get amazing crew like our yeah. dop stephen allenson man he made our short film look like a million dollar feature mm. on the budget of a mcdonald's happy meal <laughs> you know and 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 it is if you get and and it's 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 amazing like our sound quality that we have on like it's 5.1 and our sound you know and and it's one of those ones when you know when you're in the industry that we're in when you're passionate or you know because we do what we do for what because we love to do it not 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 for a money value you mm -hmm. know we do it because we love it now when you do that it's amazing how many people, how how many professionals, when they see a project that they believe in, mm -hmm. will then go, look, I don't care. There's just some projects that, sure, I'm not going to get paid for it, but I believe in the project mm -hmm. and I want to help you. You know, our sound was done by Oscar winner um, Mike Hedges. He's won a couple of Oscars for sound wow. at Park Road Post, you know, so our sound is phenomenal. <laughs> And um, Tani up John Betson, you know, he was our composer and he's he's just phenomenal. And again, you know, it was just one of those ones where he read the script and saw the footage that we shot and he was just like, dude, I've, there's no way I cannot wow. help you. Oh, wow. You know, that's great. I can't be a part of this. So, so that's, for me, that's, that's probably one of the, one of the proudest things that I've done because again, for me, it wasn't to try and do the best short film to win all these awards. For mm -hmm. me, it was just to, to have something that went from start to finish that everyone that worked on it was proud to have worked on and that we had a tonga or a, 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 a possession, a treasure that we, you know, that basically generations after us could have and look back on the work right. and go, wow, you know, they did yeah. this or they did that. So yeah, I need to to say that you're very inspiring, Shane. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I mean, this is really cool. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear things from your perspective. How it, you know, we, we're in different fields, but a lot of the reasons that we got into what we got into are very, very similar. I similar. Mean, it, yeah, it's, it's no, and, and and you hit the nail on the head before. You know, it's 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 one of those ones where it's it's very rare to find find something to 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 do that you actually love to do as a passion. Yeah, yeah. You know, because because that that and and that's it. Like I said, I I always wanted to be in. Uh, I always thought I was going to be a sportsman. But ended up falling into into this realm and 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 just absolutely loved it. Um, and you know there hasn't been a day. You know the the earliest I've ever woken up to 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 go to a film set was one thirty a.m. in the morning and worked eighteen hours. You know, but there has not been a day that I've woken up and I haven't wanted to go to work. Right. Yeah. You know. And that's, I, I think that's the difference. When you love something, you, you, you're, just, you're just getting up to, to go and play, really. Let's be honest. And, and guess, create. Yeah. Play and create. And also, you know, said, oh, I'm sorry. There's just one other thing. Is I, I, I was looking at your credit list, and I realized that you're, um, I think, four or five years older than I am. And yet you look 10 years younger than I do. And that really pisses me off. Oh, look, look, you, you know, what's funny is that since lockdown, the film industry has gone extremely quiet. So, um, yeah. you know, because I was writing my, my, my new project, 
Um, it's about a homeless man. So I thought I'd, I'd grow, grow it out. And, and, and honestly, after growing out my beard, it looks as though, it looks as though if the film industry doesn't pick up too, too soon, I can go down to, to a, a, a department store and I can play Santa at Christmas. I yeah, think. I mean, it's, it's, but no, you still, you, you're, yeah, you look younger than I do. So I really, that pisses me off. And I'm, I'm <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, looks can be very deceiving. Me. <laughs> I have a very good makeup artist and, and, and um, the filter I have on, on my MacBook oh, Pro. Okay, yeah, wonders. sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I do have to show this comment because this is for you, Michael. Thank you for all you do for the horror community, Michael Felsha. You deserve a milkshake. <laughs> That's uh, one of my friends, Eric Gamash, who's, uh, uh, we uh, play uh, Friday the 13th, uh, the game, almost every night. And there's a, a long-running gag with me and milkshakes, which I won't get into now. But, yeah, I do deserve a milkshake. But I, I let me put it to you this way. I just, ha I just celebrated my 47th birthday, and these same group of friends, over the course of that whole day, sent me seven milkshakes via DoorDash or Grubhub. And it was like, I've had enough for quite some time. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, but but thank you, Eric. I very much appreciate that. What's your favorite milkshake? Just at, just out of it, yeah. Vanilla or salted caramel? Either one of those is my favorite. But mm. I've had them all right now. I had a I had a cornucopia of shakes that day, <laughs> and uh, it got to the point where I'm just sticking them in the freezer, and then I'm just like getting them out later. It's like, all right, what, what am I going to have today of the eighty four they sent me? Uh, so it's uh, <laughs> it's but it's fun. But uh, yeah, it's it's good to have friends even though they can be real assholes sometimes. <laughs> but it's, it's really funny because Michael does, uh, every now and then does these auctions of either titles he's worked on that he has extra copies of or like posters or just yeah. rare stuff. And during your birthday, uh, the one that I, I won was a Terror Train and Phantasm 2. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, the, doorbell during, kept, the doorbell kept ringing and shakes kept showing up. Oh, but so, that's what we were talking about. He's like, he's getting another milkshake. And I'm like, I don't And then, and then he's like, you know what I want? I want a damn pizza. As and somebody then somebody sent me a pizza. Yeah, so that was good. So <laughs> in, a weird way, in a weird way, I was just like, and you know what I would also love is a Maserati. I would love a Maserati. If anybody <laughs> can send one of those over, that would be great. But not I didn't good. show up, I bet. No, no. Yeah, Bruce like, Wayne didn't get the message. No, he didn't. Isn't it funny though? In our industry, it, it, it's like you, 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 you work in that. Like, well, especially in in the acting industry, and or even even as directors, in it, you know, you work so hard to try and make a living, and, and you try and make it financially, mm -hmm. and then to, to to get the stuff that you want, and then right. all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when they make it, they they don't have to freaking pay for the stuff that they want. <laughs> they just yeah. get given it. I mean, what the hell's up with that? Yeah, exactly. You know, know, they can now afford the stuff that they want. They don't. You know, people just give it to them. I'm just like, oh my gosh. I you know? know, it's a lose lose. You know, it's just like. <laughs> I was gonna say, if anybody wants to send me stuff, I said I'll wear it all around town. I don't care. It's like you have to buy it. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. the same way. I'm a complete whore. I'll do whatever the hell. I don't care. I'm just, oh. <laughs> same. You know, I, I'm, yeah, I'm exactly the same. It, it, it's so funny because you know I. I you know, being 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 a sportsman, and and it's so funny because you know you said Michael a bit about how I look in that. I, I, I'll tell you a good trick that I use a lot is if you wear a lot of sports gear, uh -huh. people pe people think you're fit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's just one of those little tricks that I do. You know, I wear track pants, I wear sports tops. You know, I wear a lot of Adidas and, and, and stuff like that, and people go people go. You look really fit. And I go, yeah, looks can be really deceiving, you know? Yeah, it's all smoke and mirrors, you know? It's all yeah, smoke I don't think mirrors. I don't think it would quite work with me, but it's something I'll consider because maybe, maybe <laughs> But it's um but it's 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 funny because the one thing I love is, is food, you know. So oh, so okay. I you know, if, if people want to see me fit and I love chocolate. I love right. chocolate. Yeah, you know, well I've got to keep my colour up. You know, right. so it's right. it's one of those ones where it, it, it's just like. But I really, I really want to get on on the road, and I just want to go around. And um, I actually want to come to um, America and do do your guys' um, barbecues. Oh yeah, yeah, because because over here in New Zealand, you know, I because I watch a lot of food channels there because I love oh, food. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and man, I see the barbecues and I see the ribs and the shacks and that, that you guys have, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I've got to well, go and try those. Well, where I'm up here in Michigan, and 
I, I don't think they're going to have them this summer because of obvious reasons. But uh, there's two or three barbecue festivals where you just go oh. and walk around, and there's just barbecue smoke everywhere. And oh. It's just like, you know, you just don't care. It's just like, all right, give me some of whatever the hell that is, and give me some of yeah. whatever the hell that is. And then by the time you walk out of there, it's like, I ate too much, and I don't care. It's just yeah. like, it was so good. So, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. See, the yeah. thing with yeah. the food, too, is 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 I approach it like 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 acting, you know. There's always a, a a backstory of your characters, and when I look at food, I'm I'm exactly the same. You know, it's 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 the look of it first, but but also it's it's a texture, it's a taste, it's it's you know the after the aftertaste. It's it's every I I break it down to a science, you know, <laughs> and 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 I've just got all these amalgamations that that go with it. So. So sure, you know, sometimes presentation isn't the best, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. you, you look at something and you just go, oh, what's that? But then when you taste it, man, it's made from the heart. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. It, and it just sticks with you. And then you get others that you go, oh, my gosh, that looks amazing. And you bite yeah. into it and yeah. you go, whoa, looks can be deceiving because there's nothing else there, you know? No, nothing it's there. Just, yeah. 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 And and I think that's, it. That's it. you know, it's 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 like movies. It's, it's like food oh, to yeah. me is like movies, you know? If... You 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 present uh, a dish that looks amazing, then the expectation for it is is got to be good, you know. Right. It, it, and, and if it doesn't deliver, and it's like movies with with trailers, yeah. you see some trailers and go, oh my gosh, I got to go and see that. And then you go and you go and see it, and it's just like, oh, I should have just watched the trailer because the yeah, trailer was way better than the film. <laughs> the trailer had all the best stuff in it. I didn't need yeah. to see yeah. the movie. Yeah, you know yeah, well, the, the trailer. Yeah, I don't get trailers. I don't get trailers that literally show the whole film. You know. Oh, I know. I, I much prefer those. trailers that that leave you in suspense. You know, that leaves you hanging, so you want to go and see the film. Well, because you the tease. Yeah, they're supposed to make. You yeah, go, yeah, tease it to it. Yeah, they're supposed to make you go, "Hey, what's this? I'm intrigued by this." Instead of spelling the whole thing out for you, so you're like, "Oh, okay. Well, I don't need to see the movie now. I've seen the, the whole thing." Yeah. You know? You know, and and I have to say about um, you know, I I'm probably going way off track here, but like horrors to me is 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 the same thing nowadays. You know, back back in my day when I grew up, you know, you had Friday the Thirteenth, mm-hmm. you had Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, and it and it wasn't about it wasn't about blood, gore, guts. It wasn't about you know how they die. It was all about that psychological up here when you were watching it and the soundtrack and oh, yeah. you know, and and you trying to anticipate what was going to happen you know that was and and even when you knew it was going to happen it made you jump right you know whereas now horrors just seem to be like you know i'm sitting there and i'm just like oh my gosh you know they're, they're building up the scene 10 minutes into it oh my gosh i wonder whether and then all of a sudden they show you what you know what the creature is, or or, or who's it, and you're just going, okay, well that's I don't need to try yeah. and imagine what it looks like anymore because you've just shown me everything, right? You know, and to them it's all about blood and guts, and and I just, man, I I actually really don't like that, and and, and I suppose it goes back to when you ask me about you know digital can can you know, or, or or media formats can digital compare to it's just like, man, when you when to to me. A classic is, you know, because you know, I was in both Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Right. Lord of the Rings to me still holds up, hands it does. down. It does. To, to The Hobbit, simply because to, to, to me, Lord of the Rings, um, because, it, you know, all the orcs and, and pretty much everything there was, was all done on set physically with prosthetics right. in it. So whatever the interaction was with the actors in that was real, you know? And they captured that in a real moment. Whereas when you're on a green screen or yeah. you know, you're acting against something digital, you don't physically have that emotion. You know, you're trying to act the emotion, but you're not really responding to it correctly in the moment simply because you don't have that character there. You don't have that creature there. And it's it's like um it's like Star Wars for me. Like mm-hmm. honestly, man, they should have kept stormtroopers in, in, in suits. Because <laughs> because when they made them digital, it just it you knew they were now not real, right? You know? Right. And it just it, it, there's just something about 
having a physical character there in makeup that the audience you know then believes it's 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 like when you're watching a movie and um like you know you've you've got a petite little actress that you know is a who's an amazing actor but when it comes to the fight scenes right yeah you've got these big guys who fight each other for hours and then she just taps them and they drop to the ground and you're just going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding me? She's not a superhero. So, you know, let's make this stuff realistic at least, you know? Yeah. You know? It was, that's, it, a, that's a good point, though, because when we were watching um, the the Mandalorian um, Disney Plus show about the making of the Mandalorian, yeah. and they talk about his, because the argument was always how often is he actually in the suit because you never actually see his face. Right. They right. talk about all of the different guys who do the stunts inside of the inside of the, the suit. Mandalore. But mm -hmm. if you think about it, there is a lot of acting that goes on in the way you move your body, the way you your inflection and the tone and the cadence of your voice. Mm -hmm. Like I think that what makes what makes certain people the embodiment of that character is the way they present it in their voice. Like I never thought, okay, I never thought that Freddy Krueger was necessarily scary based on the way yeah. he looked. Mm -hmm. It was the fact that Robert England's voice was a certain, it, it, it had a certain resonance in it and it had a certain kind of like, there was that he always made what he was doing sound funny Mm -hmm. And that pure, like, I get it now that I'm older, but when I was younger, aside from the fact that it could get in your dreams and that was just the creepiest thing I've ever had to deal with, but, like, it made sense the way that he was interacting with the characters and things throughout, it, throughout you know, being behind a, a prosthetic. Like, there yeah. was the way he presented it with his voice, the way he presented it with his body, the way he presented it with his face. And so that's what made him scary. It was the same thing with um, with uh, Tim Curry in, in It. I think there's that, just the, the presence of his face. Like, I still believe that his version of It is scarier than um, yeah. Skarsgård. Uh, I can't remember his first name. Mm -hmm. But um, names. Um, you know, I there are certain things about his character that are scarier, like, what is his name? Scar Bill, Scar Bill, Bill. 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 I kept on wanting to say Alex, but I know that's not Alexander. Um, so Bill Scar Scarsgard, his appearance as a human is ominous and things like that comes through in the the mini series on Hulu. So what is it called? Castle Rock. Why can't I? Why can't I do this? Like <laughs> I don't know words. Um, Castle Rock. So he is very ominous in that portrayal and that. And that, but I don't think he's as scary because everything's CGI. It's not, it's not a prosthetic, you know, face that they put on him, and he's not at exuding something through it. And so when you talk about it being real, like that is a a real fear that comes through seeing that thing that is terrorizing. You know, you. Yeah. I mean, the the only thing that I think the only movie that I've actually watched that did any justice to a CGI monster was a quiet place. And that's because you only see it for like right, yeah. 10 minutes of the yeah. film. And you, you know, it's not real. Like you can, you can yeah. tell it's CGI and it's only because it's backed up by really good actors and actresses that can play terrified. If I'm, is and really the use well. of sound in that was true. Yeah. And the absence of sound. Yeah. But, like, those things were always scary to me when I was growing up. And I think because we're a product of that of that time, we like that feel of the the way it makes us feel. Like, I, I prefer the older version to anything that's remade. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that, you know, the, the Mandalorian is a classic. For me, for me, that whole thing of, you know, and, and, and they set it up the whole thing of he never takes his helmet off. Right. No one ever sees him, you know. They built that up, and I was just like, oh, my gosh. And then when you actually did see his face, to me, that whole code just got broken for me, you know. 
I was caught up in the code of I'm never actually going to know who this guy is and what he's going to look, you know. And you see him take his helmet off and you've got the back of his head, you know, and it was just that mystery. It was just like, I love the character because I didn't actually know the character. Right. And then as soon as I saw his face, the mystery was lost for me, you know. And I was, to be, to be honest, it was one of those, huh, moments, <laughs> you know. I was just like, all of a sudden, it, it, you know, when he put his helmet back on, I knew what he looked like underneath the helmet now, you know. And I was just right. like... Yeah, just... I think though it was well, it was well played though. Like even though it was sad that the mystique was gone, it was yeah. well played because there was a sadness that went along with it. There was a nobody will ever know who I truly am, yeah. what I you know. So they only know it through the helmet. They only know it through the actions. They only know it through what you exude from that, and that the rest of the char- like we know something the rest of the characters don't know, and that's mm-hmm. the whole breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. It makes it that much more difficult for us as viewers sometimes if you're holding on to that that little tidbit. And you speaking know? of that scene, I like how they said in the making of that he actually had a, I think it was a broken nose because he right. had stepped in a two by four. So what you saw was like half fake blood and half real blood. <laughs> yeah. Again, why the documentaries and the things are important because then you're like, oh, well, how much of that really was real and yeah, yeah. Uh, no, real and, uh, and imagine because yeah. people do get hurt like oh you know. yeah i mean it's a, it's a dangerous everything's a dangerous profession there's always a possibility of something going wrong and then there's also happy accidents where they're experimenting with something and discover oh we could i didn't realize by using this technique we can also do this and sometimes the best thing in the world for a filmmaker and i've discovered this in interviewing people is if you ask any filmmaker would you rather have too much time and too much money or not enough time and not enough money they almost always say oh not enough time and not enough money because then it forces you to become creative whereas if you have too much time and too much money it's too easy to say oh we'll fix that later or we'll just you know turn over to the computer guys and they'll solve it so it's interesting that uh, limitations can often be the best thing that can happen to you as a filmmaker because it forces you to kind of really examine okay, what is this scene really about and what do we really need to accomplish what we're trying to get done here? And uh, I've come across that myself in some of the documentaries I've done. The documentaries and the best ones I've done are the ones where I had kind of time tight pressures and not quite enough money to get it done. So it focused me, it really caused me to focus on what I needed to get this piece to the where I needed it to be and not worrying about all these other things. It just kind of you know pushed all that other stuff. I was like, I don't have time to worry about this stuff. I got to worry about who do I need and how much time do I need to allot to them and what do I need to tell this story and that that sometimes can be a helpful thing. I I agree and that's a, pretty much live my life like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's due tonight at midnight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I have forty-seven I, minutes to get it done. Yeah. Make magic happen. It doesn't, it doesn't do good for my sleep or my hairline, but uh, uh, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's it's I find it works very very well. So um, as we wrap things up here, um, is there any final words that you guys would like to leave our viewers? Uh, maybe someone that uh, wants to become an actor or go into stunts or prosthetics. Um, someone that wants to do what you do, Michael. Is there? I'll, I'll start with you. Okay. Well, that's, I, I've been asked that question before, and it's always because it's not like you can go, go here and see this guy and you'll be all set up. It doesn't work that way. You have to decide for yourself what you want to do and find out a way to learn about it in a way that makes sense to you, whether whether that's going to school or apprenticing on other people's projects or doing what I did, which was watching what other people did and then going and trying it for myself and sometimes falling flat on your face. And sometimes those are the things that you learn the most from is when you make horrible fuck ups or you make really poor creative decisions and you go, Okay, well, I know never to do that again. So maybe that will lead me to something else. Um, What I found worked for me was literally just keep trying and trying and trying until I could figure out a way to do it, not necessarily on my own, but to spearhead it. Waiting for the phone to ring never works. That is a complete waste of everyone's time. It's like somewhere out there, someone's going to give me an opportunity. 
It doesn't work that way. You make you tend to make your own opportunities by the people you know, and the 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 whatever talent comes into play. But it's it's being in the right place at the right time and recognizing an opportunity or a way to make an opportunity for yourself. Uh, there's no science to it, and there's a lot of luck comes into it. A lot of luck, and sometimes people don't want to hear that that it's really just kind of on chance by luck, but. You, you can kind of make your own luck and you can kind of put things, you know, into, into play just from your determination. But what really helps is just recognizing, Hey, there's something I can do here. Let me figure out a way to do that and see what happens because you never know what one thing is going to lead to, to the next. It's, it's such a crap shoot. So the end of the day is if it is that way, go do it, give it a shot. The worst thing that can happen is, Oh, I tried something and it didn't work out. All right. But at least you're not sitting around going, boy, I would have liked to have done that, but uh, I didn't want to. I was too afraid to try or I didn't know if I'd be good at it. You know, always get up and swing for the fences every time you try something. True, you may you may hit a foul ball. True, you may hit something that kills someone in the stands and you're under arrest and something like that. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's, it's always worth it. I, I, I will always celebrate anyone who swings for the fences and fucks up rather than someone who played it safe and tried to get to first base or just bunt his way into it. Uh, Cause it, it, life's too short. You just got to kind of throw yourself into it and uh, see what the hell happens because the, the, that's the magic of life in this business is that there are no rules. Anything can happen at any time. So put yourself into a position where you can recognize those opportunities when they come along. Wow. Good advice. Or Same. just, or just, or just uh, spend money on uh, bribe people to get the job done for you. I don't know what the fuck. I, it's it's just, <laughs> I don't know. it's just hard to say. Um, you know what? For for me, yeah, because because I'm in a whole lot of different areas. So if someone wanted to be a, a get into stunts, um, my my biggest advice to them is <clears throat> you've got to like pain first. Mm. You know, yeah. stunts, stunts hurt, stunts, <laughs> stunts freaking hurt. Um, the trick with stunts is not to get injured. So, you know, if, um, if, if you don't like pain, then, then stunts is uh, the, the least thing, you know, you, over here with, you know, you can be the most talented person that flips and stuff like that. Stunts is a team effort. You've mm. got to be a team player. You've got to work as a team. You've got to know how to, you know, you, you can't be precious. You've, 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 you've got to be open to, you don't know everything. Okay. That's, a, that's probably the, the, the worst thing about people wanting to get the stunts who are, are fresh. They go onto a film set and, or they get into a team and they think the best way to get into the team and make friends with the team is to prove to everyone that they know everything. Mm -hmm. That actually doesn't work because what you what you know you're a guy that's this is this is your first time in the industry, and you're now working with guys who've been in this industry for ten years, and you're telling them you know what you're doing. No, sit back, <clears throat> step back, take in, absorb, and then when you're asked to do something, do something at two hundred percent. Right. Um, you know, don't go in there thinking you know everything. As an actor, I'd say don't. <laughs> yeah. Because um, because if you're going into you know and it, no yeah you know, let's 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 be honest, if you're going in it to become rich and famous, yeah. you're going in it with the wrong attitude. You know, if you if you want to be an actor, do it because you love to do it. Do it because it's your passion. Because. If you go in it with that, you'll you'll be like me in that you will work in the career that you're chosen to because not because it pays a lot, it's because you love what you're doing. And there's a lot of disappointment, a lot of disappointment yeah. in um in acting. You know, you go for an audition, you think that you've done the best part. In audition and you know, you don't even get close to, to getting it. And then what happens is that you watch watch the watch a show that you auditioned for, and the person that they got you like 
oh my gosh, are you serious? They chose him over me. What am I doing wrong? You know, there's a lot of disappointment. But if you're first getting into it, what what uh, my my biggest suggestion is honestly, whether it be a stunt performer or an actor, go on to a film set as an extra, because as Michael will tell you. You know, most people that, that want to get into film is, or, you know, they, they only see the glamour yeah. that's on the screen. Like, yeah. like, go on set as an extra because some people aren't cut out for, for sitting in a tent or in a green room for a eight hours. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of eight, hurry up and wait on a film set. Yeah, exactly. Or, or, or the other one is stand by to stand by. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, hurry up and wait or stand by to stand by. You know, go go on there because it, it may not be for in, anyone. My my biggest thing when I go out and do talks and that to, to classes and stuff like that is, you know, don't just whatever you have is a dream. Mm-hmm. Go for that. Don't tell. Don't let people say to you that you can't be what you dream to be, because you know if if I. If I said to kids back when I was at school, when I was you know eight and nine, I was going to be Iron Man when I grow up. Right. Yeah. You know, everyone would just laugh and, and say whatever. And yet, you know, I've played Iron Man. Right. So you know, if if if, 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 if you know if I said to kids, you know, if back back when I was that, you know, oh, I'm going to fight Wolverine when I grow up, <laughs> and everyone go, yeah, whatever. And I was just like, yeah, well, I've fought Wolverine. You know, I, I was a silver samurai. So. It's it's one of those ones, you know. If if you know, and I've got friends, you know. Don't don't think life is all about being rich, right? Having money, because I've got friends who are doctors and lawyers who wake up every day and don't want to go to work. You know, they hate going to work. I've got a friend who runs behind a garbage truck, and he is he will never give that job up. He says, "Where in the world can I get a job where I wake up at?" four in the morning i'm finished by 10 in the morning he said and i get paid to to be fit you know i get paid to train you know and he's one of the he was one of the best rugby players you know and he still you know he made the all blacks and he still ran behind when he could he still ran behind the rubbish truck you know because that's what he loved to do you know it's michael said at the beginning of this thing it's it's very hard to find something to do that you love and if you if if you've got that opportunity find what you want to do and look honestly even if you're 24 and you go i don't know what i want to do that's fine yeah you know, everyone finds what they like to do you know at any stage of their life right yeah you know, and just and just go off and do it and just don't give up don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up, no matter how hard it is. Like I went through New Zealand drama school. There were 36 of us in year one and year two. And I believe only about four of us are still going with wow. in the acting. You wow. know? So yeah, it's it's a hard industry. Get get ready for disappointment, get ready for for the pain, the struggle, the hurt. But if it's passionate, if if it's your passion, you know, you don't care about that. That's what makes you grow. That's what makes you learn. That's what makes you strive to get better. Yeah. You know? So yeah. They both that's that's a good way to end this show. It's a perfect, <laughs> perfect advice. Yeah. You know? Find something you love and do it and be all out. Well, basically. you just have to look at both of you, Brian and Nicole, you know? It's 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 like you you know obviously this is something you love to do, and um, you know and and look at you both you know you 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 get people to come on your show and 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 talk about them you know and and what you love to do is now opening it up to a wider audience mm-hmm. for people you know your your passion is opening up to other people what their interests are. You know, so 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 it is. It's just one of those books. Everyone has a passion. Everyone has something that they want to give, and it just so happens that it could open the door for other people. You know, and 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 help help them create. Now, I I am getting paid to do this, right? 
Uh, let me. As soon as somebody signs a check for us, we are happy to sign one for you. Okay, because I only, <laughs> I, only do, I only do things for the money. I'm not really much for passion and all that shit. I, what about I just, a milkshake? I just, I just want the cash. Uh, so, I would be screwed if I was working for money. Oh, so would I. Believe me, I did not, <laughs> I did not get into the DVD extras business because I thought, oh man, that's that's cash city. I'm gonna be sitting on mountains of money after this is all over. It knew. No, that's, yeah, you're gonna be you know, you're gonna be sitting same. on that Robert Downey Jr. money. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's you just... know, and, and and that's the same with the film industry as well. You know, it's you know, people, people the, the hardest thing is when people say, "Oh, how much do you get paid?" Yeah. Because I don't like telling them how much they get paid. Not because I I don't want people to know. It's because if I tell them how much I get paid weekly, they're gonna go, "Oh my gosh, what." You get paid that much. The only trouble is you're only getting paid that much weekly as long as your contract is. But, right. you know, if, if, if I, you know, some years I look at it, man, I, I, would have, I would have made more, probably twice as much, flipping burgers at McDonald's. Right, yeah, same than, here. Yeah. You know, than, than, than I would actually being, being, being on, on the film set because you only get paid for the project you're on, you know, and, and if you only work three months of the year, it means the other nine months you're trying to survive and find work, you know, yeah, and, and that's it. Yeah. That's why I said if, if you're passionate about something, you will always keep going with it, you know, you, you won't get disheartened with it because the, you there is a lot of rejection and a lot of disappointment in what you do. And, and, and the hardest thing is actually keeping yourself motivated. Right to keep going, you know. Yeah, I think uh, in both of your careers, um, what you would have earned money-wise, you've earned in the the friends that you made along the way. Yeah, oh, experiences yeah. you've had probably. Oh, in, terms the, totally. in terms of the experiences and the things that I've learned, and the friends that I've made, and just the things that I've gotten to do, there's no amount of money that can be put yeah. or assigned to that. That's that's. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the people that I would have gotten to meet and the the the, the experiences. I mean, it's that's worth its weight. There, the, there, there's no way to put a value on that stuff. Just yeah, I mean that it's the you know the, the the experiences that I've had. Like, bro, I'm I'm a little Maori boy from the east coast of New Zealand. I come from a town called Tiki Tiki that has a thriving. It's a thriving metropolis of about 200 people. <laughs> now. It's 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 one of those sounds like uh, you know that the, the only people that, that that really make it up there are, are unemployed and 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 people who uh, have got green thumbs and know how to grow marijuana. Let's be honest, <laughs> you know. But it's it's you know to to get out of there and break out of there like the, the experiences that I have had are absolutely priceless. You know the places I've travelled to worldwide. You know uh, I get to go to conventions. I get to meet people. I I get to work in overseas countries. You know it's it, it is it is absolutely priceless. Um, I I'd, I'd I'd never give it up. I'd, yeah. I'd never, I'd, I'd never change what I've done. I'd, I'd never give up, and and that is that is probably the most valuable uh, piece of of everything. It's just the experiences that you get and the friendships and the people that you meet are, yeah. are lifelong and priceless. Yeah. You know, I appreciate both of you coming on today. Um, and before we let you guys go, uh, where can people find you? Oh, um, am I? Oh, you can find me on Facebook uh, at the Redshirt Pictures, or just Facebook Michael Felsher, or you can go to RedshirtPictures.com. It has all my work up there and everything that I've ever done, and uh, uh, that's how you can find me. Um, if you want to find me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm relatively easy to, to locate, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm not. That's 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 where I'll be. As for me, you'll probably find me at the bottom of the barrel, and, and not even at the bottom. Actually, under and un, underneath it, like 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 most people, you know, they, they see the top of the barrel, then they, they then they go to the bottom. Yeah, turn. Yeah, actually, pull that barrel up. I'm actually underneath it. But um, but yeah, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram. Um, 
you, you know, I'm, I'm kind of there. You can look me up on YouTube, type my name into YouTube, and a whole lot of stuff comes up. And cool, yeah, yeah. all of you the, guys, yeah, all over the place. Oh, any future projects, projects that you're allowed to talk about? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just finishing up uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie for Screen Factory, um, The Kindred for Synapse Films, and then Massacre at Central High, also for Synapse Films. And uh, I just did uh, commentaries for a couple of movies for Arrow, uh, Bloodstone and Blood, uh, Blood Cult and Bloodstone. And then there's uh, a, a whole bunch of other stuff that's coming. Oh and, oh, and the big thing is I did all, a lot of the uh, special features and the commentary tracks for the first season of uh, Creep Show, the television series Creep Show. And that's oh, nice. it's just now coming out on uh, Blu ray. And they're bringing me down when production finally resumes. I will be filming and doing all the uh, special features for season two. I'll be on set for season two when that uh, resumes. Uh, hopefully, any day now. I mean, I, I got the gig to do season two the day they shut production down, so it was just like, oh, my god. Damn. <laughs> oh, but you know, we're all just waiting with bated breath to figure out when all things are going to start resuming again. So when they do, I'll be down in Atlanta uh, shooting everything for season two. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, yeah, it's kind of what I've got going on at the moment. All right. Shane, what about you? Uh, yeah, I was supposed to be doing a Netflix film called The Beast um, hmm. that that was supposed to start filming down here uh, in March. And, of course, we got into lockdown and we'll have to wait and see what happens there, whether or not it actually comes back or, or whether or not it's been you know going too long. Um, and also, yeah, I've got, I've got a little cameo little character in uh avatar it's um oh it's it's, it's coming up so yeah. cool yeah and then yeah but apart from that no not really i've just been working on on, on my own project trying to and uh and, and a couple other projects trying to get down this way uh film called end of the empire um trying to trying, trying to help a buddy get that off the ground and yeah and just just working on and doing some writing on my own thing Cool. Once again, thank you for coming on. You guys are always welcome back. And uh, thank you. Hey, when you come to America, you, you're gonna have to stop here in Florida, and we'll have to hang out. Yeah, man, I'd, I'd, I'd love and to. We'll wear our sports attire so we can all look as fit as you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shane, it was a real pleasure meeting you. I'm glad we got the chance to to meet and to do this. This was nice. Yeah, Michael, same, exactly cool. the same. It was an absolute pleasure. And it's, cool, uh, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and and yeah, thank you guys very much for yes, thank um, you and, and inviting me on the show, man. It's it's an absolute pleasure, and you know, hopefully, I wasn't too boring. <laughs> no, God, no, it was good. <laughs> yeah, I thought both of you brought something uh, interesting to the table here. Like I said, you guys work on you know in the same industry, but on the opposite side, and yeah. to, to see how well you guys think of each other. Um, and then oh, also yeah. sharing your stories with everybody that's watching. Yeah, cool. Well, I was happy to do it. Thanks for having me on, and uh, we'll do it again sometime, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. and a shout out to Terry McIver. You know, thanks, thanks a lot for um, for your little uh, comment there on 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 myself and Michael coming on the show. And um, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that was. For, oh, I see it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, and 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 um, no, I think you guys did a great job of actually bringing us both on because yeah, um, even though even though we're in totally different areas of of the industry, um, we, you know, it's it, it's it's funny how how we you know our paths actually do do cross our, our careers yeah. do cross, and it's it's a it, it, it's it's a good balance of in front and behind. How we realize, yeah, how we realize our roles in the industry are different, but. Yeah. And then the reasons that we do it are very, very similar. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's very easy to relate to someone like that. So, yeah. and also, again, like I said, he's older than me. He looks younger than me. So I, I'm, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I, so I'm, I'm both uh, uh, impressed and envious and pissed off. It's really good. It's, it's <laughs> I'm, I'm not very tall, though. You're probably taller than me. How tall are you? Six, four. Okay. Yeah. I'm five, seven. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. so we're gonna we're gonna end the show here but i want to keep you guys on for after we go off the air 
But um, okay. as you guys have been seeing, um, we have awesome guests like this uh, that we like to bring on, uh, whether it's from the film industry or the pro wrestling uh, industry. And we like to, to hear their journey and, and their craft that they're doing. We've just uh, started a PayPal account um, that uh, if you like what we're doing and want to see more guests like this, um, everything that goes to that PayPal account uh, goes straight into the show uh, to help us in, improve what we're doing. Uh, and bring more guests on like this. Um, it will eventually, hopefully, provide a backdrop. A backdrop, yes. <laughs> no, where there's not a glare through the window and I don't know. Yeah. It's yeah. junk. <laughs> 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 this is our kitchen table, and um, hopefully, maybe there'll be a sound. Maybe someday there'll be soundproofing, either for our room or wherever we're stashing the children <laughs> and the dog maybe because he was actually louder than the children today <laughs> but uh yes i hope everybody knows i'm joking and we're not stashing kids in a closet or anything <laughs> oh that would be bad especially if they find out you're a teacher and all that oh no i mean all the, <laughs> you heard the ice machine right yeah and then the chocolate milk and then the dog barking i mean nobody's locked up anywhere here like they're, they're full reign of the house. We're just maybe maybe that's what you can call your show, the kitchen. Yeah, you know, just embrace, <laughs> just embrace the whole thing. Yeah, know? just embrace like, it. Just yeah. you know, we're at the mercy of the tiny army we created. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Brian All and right. Nicole brought to you from the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so the kitchen table. Until yeah. uh, next week, guys. Thank you for joining. <laughs>